Welcome back, everyone. Sorry for the delay. We were making sure we were live on YouTube. So we're going to continue with our talks. And our next speaker is Dr. April Wright. Dr. April Wright's talk is Patient Analysis in Phylogenetic Paleontology, Interpreting the Posterior Sample. Her talk is gonna be 15 minutes long and followed by a Q&A session of five minutes. You can record a session, we are actually streaming it live on YouTube. She's comfortable with receiving questions in English and she will be answering in English as well. Dr. April is an assistant professor at Southeastern Louisiana University and her lab works on phylogenetic methods, particularly for integrating fossils and molecular data to estimate data trees. Dr. April Wright, are you with us right now? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Welcome, Dr. April. We're really happy to have you here now. And we're super excited to hear your talk. So all right. all yours. Okay, can everyone hear me okay and see my slides all right? Perhaps just- Yes, no yes we, can, we can see and hear you well. Perfect, all right. Now let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for that introduction, Natalia, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be part of this meeting. This is a very cool effort that you guys have organized. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about um, Bayesian analyses in um, you know, phylogenetic paleontology and particularly something that I think we haven't done an excellent job of, which is extracting more information out of our posterior sample. And so I'm just going to orient us a little bit to, um, oh, actually first, um, you are certainly welcome to tweet about this talk, take pictures during it, anything you want. Um, this is recently published work with uh, my co-author Graham Lloyd. Uh, that link there goes to uh, the website for the paper. You can read the paper there. You can see all of the R code and stuff used to generate this. Certainly welcome to it. These talk slides are also there if you'd like to view them later. Right, so for those of you who might not be familiar, I'd like to start off by orienting us a little bit to the idea of Bayesian phylogenetics. And the basic idea uh, to Bayesian phylogenetics here is that we are estimating plausible combinations of tree topology and other model parameters uh, that make sense given a particular phylogenetic model and data. Um, so for example, this is a figure from uh, a manuscript I have in press with Rachel Warnock. Um, and this is basically the model components for a dated phylogenetic tree using the fossilized birth data. So we have our phylogenetic characters. Those could be morphology. They could be molecular data. We have our fossil ages. And then if we're estimating a dated phylogenetic tree, we need some sort of substitution model that describes how either a morphological character transitions to another morphological character or how DNA bases um, change over time. We would need a clock model that describes how rates of evolution are distributed across the tree and a tree model that describes how speciation events are distributed through time. Um, and these are all related through Bayes' theorem. On the left-hand side of the equation is the posterior that we're trying to estimate. It's the parameters uh, likelihood given the data and the model. On the right-hand side, we have an expression of you know, the likelihood of the data given the parameters of the model, any sort of priors. So uh, any prior intuition that we have about the distribution of our model parameters and those are divided by the marginal probability of the data, so the data given the model, right? And when we put this all together, um, here we've substituted those little pictures um, in for, uh, you know, um, for words. When we put everything together, the posterior, we have, you know, the probability of all of our model parameters given our data. Um, on the right-hand side of that equation, we then have the probability of our character data given all of the other model uh, components the probability of our time tree, given our time tree model, any sorts of priors that we have on those parameters, and then the marginal probability of the data. Um, typically, we estimate 
Bayesian trees through uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, where we start with some uh, starting parameters, we estimate a likelihood for them. We make changes to one or more of our model parameters. In this case, we've changed the tree, right? We've swapped up, whoops. I accidentally changed both trees on this figure. <laughs> um, pretend the tree shows a different set of relationships. Um, but we make changes to one or more um, parameters in, in our model. And then we see if our starting values or our new values are better than our starting values. And if they are, we keep them. If they're not, we generally don't keep them. And, um, and what this Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm means is that solutions are visited in proportion to how likely they are. So a good tree will be visited many times. A poor tree will be visited a few times. And that means that the distributions of solutions has information as well. And this is sort of a contrast with other methods. And so here I've got, uh, you know, forest and a tree. Um, you know, oftentimes when it comes to maximum likelihood and parsimony, we are looking for one tree. We might not be able to estimate one tree if uh, there are multiple most parsimonious trees, but that's the goal. In Bayesian phylogenetics, we're asking, well, what about this tree that's close to the best tree? Does that have information? How about these ones? Um, is there, you know, can we learn something else from trees that are not necessarily the absolute best? And to me, this kind of gets at a very fundamental question about what a phylogeny is. Right? So phylogeny is a, relation, is a hypothesis about the relationships between the tips of a tree, right? Which means that we're estimating divergences that occurred millions of years ago, perhaps hundreds of millions of years ago, depending on your taxa. Uh, in contemporary, uh, contemporary methods, such as like the fossilized birth death, we might be estimating parameters for a lot of value, or estimating values for a lot of parameters. And when we look at our data sets in the best sampled groups, we often have patchy species and locus coverage if you have any sort of molecular data. In the fossil record, we can only hope to be able to sample a minuscule fragment of the paleodiversity that was there. And we often have, you know, hard, um, known biases such as hard parts fossilizing better, or um, I often work with ants. Uh, in that case, we have fossil biases along with life history. So if an ant has a tree habit where it might be caught in sap, we have much better data quality from those taxa. So we're trying to estimate long ago events from data that are scarce and could even be biased. And so, uh, in my opinion, the best thing we can be about that is humble. And that means becoming friendly with the uncertainty and looking at the distribution uh, of trees for all of the information that they might have. All right. Um, so how do we think about the posterior? And I'm going to talk to you today about some work that follows up on a paper that Rob Sansom and colleagues published in 2018. And what they did was they did something very clever. Um, which they did a comparison between Bayesian and parsimony trees using measures of stratigraphic congruence. So in stratigraphic congruence, um, that's a measure of, actually, I think I have this on the next slide. There we go. Um, no, no, I don't have it on the next slide. Um, measures of stratigraphic congruence. Look at how well a phylogeny fits the actual rock record um, that the fossils were generated from. Uh, and you can see on this graph, uh, he has, uh, some box plots showing different uh, distributions of different um, measures of stratigraphic congruence. And uh, from these box plots, what they concluded was that parsimony trees have better stratigraphic congruence than trees estimated through Bayesian um, analyses. And I thought this was a really uh, kind of clever idea because this is more of an extrinsic quality. Uh, in a lot of studies, of you know, kind of Bayesian versus parsimony, people focused a bit on uh, Robinson Fools and how different uh, a tree, um, you know, simulated tree is from uh, the tree under which it was simulated, right? Um, and this is a little more extrinsic. We're looking at how well uh, does the tree approximate kind of the empirical reality. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to estimate stratigraphic congruence, um, but basically all of these metrics, in some way, are going to be quantifying how consistent a phylogeny is with the actual kind of rock record that generated the fossils. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about minimum implied gap today. So this is the sum of the branch lengths excluding any tip durations. Uh, and we expect this to be a positive number in millions of years. All right. 
Um, so what Sansom et al. did was they uh, took 500 samples from the posterior and compared those with the most parsimonious tree or the uh, most parsimonious set of trees. And we got to wondering, um, you know, is there more information in the posterior than what a random sample is necessarily going to show us? So for example, um, this is from uh, the paper Graham and I just published. Uh, what we can see is that in general, we expect trees that are sort of more similar to each other to be uh, more similar in terms of their stratigraphic congruence. And, you know, we got to wondering about if we could look at the distribution of this quantity across the posterior sample of trees. Um, so something that's been a type of analysis that's been kind of published for quite a long time is tree set visualizations. So these are graphics that display trees in two uh, D space based on their proximity to one another. So based on how similar those trees are. So for example, these two trees right here that are sort of overlapping, those are very structurally similar. They show very similar sets of relationships as opposed to say this tree here and this tree here, which we would expect to show quite different sets of relationships. And we wondered, will we see structure in stratigraphic congruence score if we looked at this in tree space. So could this be a valuable tool for looking at variation among the posterior sample? And you know, is this how we see our forest? When we talk about a forest or a tree, is this how we could look usefully at the posterior sample? Um, so what we ultimately did was we estimated parsimony trees and Bayesian trees for 127 uh, published paleontological matrices. Um, we calculated stratigraphic congruence for all equally parsimonious trees and the Bayesian posterior sample in an R package called strap. Um, and we modified um, the code for the software, are we there yet to color points in tree space by their stratigraphic congruence score? We also calculated some basic summary tables across the tree data sets um, from the tidyverse. So what we found is uh, something similar to what Rob Sansom et al had found previously, which is that 63% of data sets had the highest average stratigraphic congruence uh, when estimated with parsimony. But in 94% of the data sets, the tree that had the best stratigraphic congruence was observed in the Bayesian posterior sample. On the flip side, in 99% of the data sets, the lowest stratigraphic congruence value was found in the Bayesian posterior sample. So that sort of paints an image um, that I'm going to show on this, uh, let me zoom out on, a little bit on this. Um, these are these results as a box plot. I'm just going to show you two example data sets. Um, what we see here, so this is the distribution of stratigraphic incongruent or congruent scores. Lower is better. This is like golf. Um, we have a parsimony and Bayesian sample. And what we see in this sample is that um, the Bayesian posterior set basically subsumes the entire parsimony sample. So we find uh, we're exploring the space a bit more thoroughly. And when we look at this as a tree space plot, so each one of these points is a tree from the posterior sample. This large point here is, a tr is the most parsimonious tree. What we do see is that there's a little bit of or, um, kind of tree space structure to how stratigraphic congruence scores are distributed, but it's not a, a really strong structure. So again, uh, lower is better. So these trees up here in the purple and blue are trees that are more congruent with the rock record. Uh, and so if you look at this, um, you know, the parsimony sample has sampled, or uh, the parsimony set consists of one single tree um, that has fairly poor stratigraphic congruence. When you look across the Bayesian sample, we're exploring that space much more thoroughly, and that means finding some trees that are better. We also find some trees that are worse, right? So this more bright yellow means worse score than this kind of mustard yellow. So uh, with the Bayesian sample, you're kind of getting a little bit more of the good with the bad. We're finding some better trees, but we're also finding some worse ones. And this finding also sort of holds up with another example data set that I, um, that I have here, where again, um, you know, for the most part, the Bayesian sample subsumes the entire parsimony set. And you can see that again on this tree space plot. Uh, in this case, there is very little structure to um, the distribution of uh, stratigraphic congruence scores. But what you do see is that there are two kind of islands of tree space in which we have trees that are more similar to each other in this island and trees that are more similar to each other in this island. Um, 
And one thing that I want to point out about this is that again, we absolutely we find the absolute best trees in the Bayesian sample. We also find the absolute worst trees in the Bayesian sample. Um, but because these are islands, if you were to build a consensus tree of this, uh, that consensus tree might not even belong to a tree that was sampled here. Um, which means that really you do want to be examining carefully. If you're using parsimony methods, you want to be examining carefully each of those trees um, and thinking very carefully about where the signal in your um, consensus tree is coming from. So in summary, Bayesian methods estimate a sample of solutions. Unlike other methods, the distribution of um, that sample um, is important. It's information in and of itself. And looking at that full distribution of trees can provide us with information that one single solution might not. Uh, and so my feeling is sort of, we shouldn't necessarily be asking is Bayesian or parsimony better. We should instead be looking for ways to comfortably visualize variation uh, in large samples and large data sets. Right, um, and I really, I think this tree space visualization way provides an easy and intuitive way to do this sort of looking at variation. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take questions. I wanna extend a sincere thank you to the organizers of this event. Um, it's been really incredible to see all of the people from all of the world um, getting a chance to come together and participate. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dan Warren and Rob Lanfear for um, this, are, you, are we there yet uh, software package which, um, you know, this whole paper really is kind of an open science uh, victory where, you know, we took open software, hacked it, and came up with something entirely new. Uh, and of course, um, the biggest thank you to my co-author and partner in crime, Dr. Graham Lloyd. Thank you very much, Dr. April, for your amazing talk. So uh, I would like you to excuse me just for one minute because, okay, my bad. I forgot to remember, to remind everyone about our code of conduct, and this is vital because we are working on basically five platforms, Discord, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Zoom as well. So it is important for everyone to keep that um, code of conduct in mind because we want this experience to be as enriching as possible and respectful between all the participants in the event. So yeah, before typing, before writing, before making a comment, a question, whatever it is, we really implore you to be respectful. And I'm gonna say this in Spanish because it's very important. Entonces, por favor, a todos los asistentes uh, y los participantes en este simposio, queremos recordarles nuestro código de conducta que está disponible también en la página web del evento. Queremos que esta experiencia sea lo más enriquecedora posible para todos y por eso es vital que mantengamos un comportamiento apropiado y respetuoso entre todos los participantes de la reunión del SBE. Entonces, bueno, sin más comentarios, muchas gracias a todos por el espacio para recordarles esto tan importante. Y ahora sí, uh, we can continue with questions for Dr. Wright. So Jorge or Julie, if you want to help me out with that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, Avery, I think you can also check the very first question. Okay. Uh, I'm just reading out loud. Uh, so the first one is by William Gerti. Uh, he, he says, I'm guessing the Bayesian analysis were run without tip dating. I'd imagine with tip dating, the Bayesian trees should be much more congruent with the fossil record. Yeah, that's correct, Will. Um, and that's exactly uh, kind of how this works. And you often do see um, the stratigraphic congruence metrics working with the undated trees. Um, I think Benedict King had a um, preprint that he posted this week looking at um, uh, tip dating congruence and stratigraphic, uh, strat or, sorry, tip dating methods and stratigraphic congruence uh, measures. So. That might be something to keep an eye out for. I haven't, I haven't read it, and I might have actually just hallucinated that. I've been at home with my kids for uh, months now, um, but I, I'm pretty sure there's a preprint on this now. Okay, so uh, we're taking the, the last one because we are running out of time again. Uh, so this is uh, by Joseph uh, Keating. Why do you think parsimony trees have higher average stratigraphic consistency? Is this because of data peaking? I think that's um, more or less the issue. Um, my co-author Graham Lloyd uh, often describes 
uh, this whole situation as, as sort of like uh, if you crack an egg over, uh, you know, over a bowl of rice, right? You'll have the, uh, the yolk at the top and kind of the rest of it dribbling down. Um, and so I think a big part of the issue is that we explore much more of the space of bad solutions um, with, uh, uh, with a Bayesian method. And you know, that's by design, right? We, uh, we, we take everything, not pre-filtering kind of down to the best possible solutions first. So I, I think that's exactly, I think you're exactly right. Okay, well, that, that's it. Thank you very much for your time, for your talk. It was really nice. Yes, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Thank you, Jorge, for helping us with the questions. So moving on. We are very pleased to introduce you to our next speaker. She's Dr. Luna Luisa Sanchez Reyes and her talk is continual updating of the evolutionary estimates with the open tree of life with five scraper. He, uh, sorry, her talk is gonna be 15 minutes long, followed by a Q&A session of five minutes. You can feel free to take some notes of this talk or share any, any materials of this talk. Uh, she will be happy to receive questions in English or Spanish and answer in any of those languages. Dr. Luna Luisa, she is a postdoc at the McTavish lab at the School of Natural Sciences of the University of California, Merced, and her research interests include species diversification processes, timing of the species origin, the intercept between micro and macro evolution, open science and science communication and reproductibility. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sanchez Reyes for being with us today. Thank you so much for the introduction um, and thank you for the invitation and for putting up this wonderful um, symposium. I'm very, I'm very um, excited and honored to be here. Um, so um, yeah, as um, Natalia said, I am, my name is Luna Sanchez Reyes and I did my PhD, um, I'm a biologist, I did my PhD in Mexico City with the um, amazing Susana Magallon in phylogenetic models of speciation and extinction. Uh, but then I started um, getting interested in the ways that we could use the phylogenetic information that is accumulating constantly. Um, so I was very, um, it was very lucky to um, get a job with the wonderful Brian O'Mara at the University of, um, of Knoxville in Tennessee, where I started working on open science and science communication and putting up um, a platform to make available um, scientific data on time of lineage divergence uh, obtained from, from dated phylogenies. Little did I know that all the abilities and knowledge that I was, um, I was getting there would allow me to get the position uh, as a postdoctoral researcher that I have now in the University of California, I'm working with the wonderful Emily Jane McTavish. Um, so today I'm gonna present, let me I'm gonna put my whole screen. Um, today I'm going to present the work that we've been doing for the past um, about six, seven months, along with a former postdoc um, from the lab, Martha Cancera. So what is PyScraper? It is, in very general terms, a tool that takes a published starting alignment and a published and the corresponding um, published phylogeny, and it uses the starting alignment as seed to um, search molecular DNA databases in order to get new sequences, extend the alignment, and hopefully update our um, evolutionary knowledge from a particular group. And the goal is to be able to automatize this process to make it um, continuous in order to incorporate new DNA sequences every day or, or in, a, in a regular way, if, if not every day. Um, so you might wonder that, or might think of other tools that maybe do the same, um, but I want to convince you like why, why it is important to have <laughs> to have a more specific um, tool. So we live in the, in the big data era now, and we have the challenge that new information um, from, from organism is being accumulated um, every day from um, geographical locations um, of observations in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or um, that actually incorporates um, um, observations from from citizens uh, citizen science science oh, citizens yeah 
citizen science um, or scientific citizens. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Um, so, so this information also on behavior, on um, um, climatic um, correlation to the to the um, location of organism is being accumulating, accumulating every day. So, as a bi as biologists, we are having a hard time keep it, keeping up to date in the reanalysis of this um, of this new data. So, one way to um, to be more efficient in our update of scientific knowledge. Um, would be to use um, the knowledge that already exists and then just update it with the new data that is coming coming in continuously. Um, so some some smart people have said that um, in order to understand the present and to better pre predict our future, it is very important to be able to um, understand our past. And as evolutionary biologists, we know that um, a key part of, of our, our bi uh, biology studies and um, evolution is to understand the evolutionary relationships both um, among living and extinct species. However, um, this is a big data problem. Some estimates say, um, say that we have between 3 million and 100 million extinct species. And this only um, represents 0.1% of all the species that have existed in our planet. Um, so this means that we want to know the relationships between 3 billion and 10 billion species um, that have that exist now and that have existed in the past. Um, I, I usually have a hard time like grasping these big numbers like in the order of billions. So if you think of one species as one second, Three million, 3 million seconds is equivalent to 34 days, 100 million seconds is equivalent to three years, then 3 billion, 3 billion seconds jumps to 95 years, so almost a century, and 10 billion seconds jumps to 3,600 years, so almost four millennia. So we, we have, yeah, we have a very big uh, task in hand if we want to know the relationships of all organisms that have existed on Earth. Um, however, um, not everything is lost. Um, the Open Tree of Life project has been um, accumulating taxonomic information and information from published phylogenies since 2012. They have, the goal of the Open Tree of Life project is to construct a single tree of all life. They started with only extant um, organisms, but now they are starting to incorporate fossil organisms too. Um, and they, the, the synthetic tree has now 2.4 million tips and 90,000 of these tips have phylogenetic information. And this, this is the, the synthetic tree from 2015. The dark, the dark um, lineages show the, the ones that have phylogenetic information. And this taxonomic backbone um, has been put together thanks to the, the um, marvelous and massive effort of the Open Tree tech, of a project within the Open Tree, which is the, the assembly of a unified um, taxonomy, which integrates uh, integrates taxonomic data from eight different taxonomies: the the microbial RNA um, taxonomy Silva, the um, 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 or, uh, marine species of the world. Um, um, database, taxonomic database, which is worms, the NCBI taxonomy. And let me show you. Mm, yeah. And this taxonomy has um, more than 4 million entries, uh, but only 2.4 correspond to species. Um, so um, moving a little bit, yeah, like to how much information is available, their uh, phylogenetic information in particular. There are estimates that say that there must be a little bit um, around 10, more or less 10,000 published phylogenies. Um, so this makes us wonder why does the um, Open Tree of Life only has integrated a little bit more than 1,000 phylogenies. And one thing is that it's, it takes time. It is hard to curate the, the uploaded information, but um, very often the published phylogenies are only made available as as, as a PDF or as a graph, as an image in the publication, and the the files that can be um, read by a computer and then reanalyzed and integrated to other phylogenies 
are usually not made available. Um, so this study um, in, from 2014 set to the task of emailing the authors that didn't make available the, um, the files, uh, the, file, the three files in a reusable way to see if they would be willing to, to send them and only half of, of these authors um, did it. So this means that about one third of the um, published phylo the data, the phylogenetic data that has been published is kind of lost forever because we cannot really um, use it for other, um, to answer other scientific questions. So this leaves us with only probably one, um, one alternative to, to get um, our, to get the information from published phylogenies, and this is um, reanalyzing the raw molecular data from, from databases in order to construct um, a, a, an alignment, basically a homology hypothesis to, to run again the, um, our phylogenetic analysis. Um, luckily, as biologists, we are, we are uh, much better at sharing mole raw molecular data, and um, since the 1980s, Several databases have been accumulating um, these types of information. We have now about seven trillion nucleotide bases in, in these joint databases. And only in GeneBank um, alone, we have 200 million um, non-genomic sequences. Um, so how do we um, construct a homology hypothesis from, uh, from all this um, information? You can, of course, go to the website and do it by hand, um, but this takes a lot of time and it's not really reproducible. Um, so biologists started coding and putting up pipelines that uh, would allow to mine these huge um, DNA databases in order to construct and assemble um, homology hypotheses to, hope to, to get more information on phylogenetic relationships um, from across the tree of life. Um, they have been very good in starting um, workflows that are more reproducible. Um, however, um, this, the problem is that these pipelines are kind of seen with skepticism in the community. And also it is often seen that um, when we have manual curation of the homology hypothesis, the alignments, we get better phylogenies. And also it is hard to maintain software. So if we, it gets unfunded, then the pipeline doesn't work anymore. And it's, 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 um, it's a, a, a challenge. Um, so also, again, luckily, this um, database, the TreeBase database, has been accumulating trees and their corresponding underlying alignments since 1994, which was the, the year that the Linux operating system, the first release of the Linux um, operating system came, came out. Um, this database has more than 8,000 alignments, and it has resolved, um, well, it resolves, uh, it has trees that resolve um, phylogenetic relationships for more than 10,000 um, species. And the Tree of Life um, has integrated these, um, the, the phylogenetic, phylogenetic trees that are available in the tree based database. However, the alignments are only um, loosely linked in the Open Tree of Life. Uh, website as a link to the publication here. So let me show you. Um, this is the same, the same web page that I'm showing on the on the um, presentation. And if you go to this link to data package, it will get you to the um, TreeBase website. And these are the trees that are associated to this particular study. And in this tab, um, we have the matrices um, that that are associated to the trees or that are underlie the, the, the trees, but um, there is no real way to, to automatically connect the alignments and the phylogenetic trees within TreeBase or um, within the Open Tree of Life website. Um, so what this is basically why, why Fyscraper exists. It is a way to automatically link the different types of information uh, in different um, databases by taking advantage of the standardized taxonomy of the open tree of life. So we can not only update our phylogenetic um, knowledge um, with new data, but we can integrate um, other types of biological information from other databases by using the, taxon the taxonomies that other databases use. Um, so what, what exactly does it do? Um, 
So we have this mock example of this little tree of four turtles. And this tree has been made available in the open tree of life and it has been standardized to, to their open, um, to their unified taxonomy. So it has these taxonomic identifiers. And this allows us to link um, these, these um, phylogenetic positions to the to alignments in tree base and also to limit the, the, um, the, the search of new sequences in molecular databases to, to, to a specific taxa, taxa to, to the in-group or, um, or, or a certain um, taxon in the, in, the, in the original tree, in the input tree. Once the data has been integrated, um, we can easily reanalyze it with any uh, software for phylogenetic analysis, either Mac, like your favorite, um, your favorite um, philosophy for, for constructing alignments, either maximum likelihood, Bayesian um, parsimony, whatever you want. Um, so once we have the phylogenetic tree, we have the, the um, alignment, we give it to we, we give that to PyScraper and then it will start a search in NCBI to get new sequences um, constrained to, to this particular um, taxon. And then hopefully you will get some updated knowledge uh, from species that have never been um, integrated into any uh, phylogenetic hypothesis. So more technically, how does it work? Um, it is a Python tool that, um, I don't know how well I am in time, but here is how you would run it on a command line. Like it has a lot of arguments. Um, and you can also run it in a Jupyter notebook if you want to use it for education or in the classroom. Um, the way that, that the, the different um, taxonomies are linked together is using Python dictionaries. And then this um, data is stored as CSV files that look like this. So we have the original name, we have the different, um, different taxonomies and results from the, from, the, from the blast results. And then this allows for um, the, uh, this, this interoper interoperability of multiple databases, which means that we can use data from, from GBIF or, or, um, or any other database, a behavioral database or a, or a um, 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 morphological character database to, that uses any of the taxonomies that the Open Tree of Life uses to integrate it into a phylogenetic context. Um, so maybe right now um, we are we are working on developing some examples um, from like real real trees, and this is a tree of the Malvasia, which is the family of chocolate. And he, we are explaining like how to find the trees, um, and this is the main result, which is the original tree and the updated tree using a starting alignment uh, from the original publication which in a way represents the expert, expert knowledge of, of the authors that published this tree in 2011. And then putting this into context um, on, the, on all the family Malvasia, which has 5,000 species, we can see that the red, um, the red um, branches represent the newly added taxa, the, the um, dark linnet um, branches represent the the taxa that were in the original phylogeny and the gray taxa represent the information, represents the information that we only have taxonomy for it. So we still have a long way to go. And this is why we think that we, we, need, um, we need tools that allow us to, to make this task easier because we, we still have a lot of, of um, knowledge to, to get uh, from nature. And then if you want to try PyScraper, um, there's a website, we develop a website with all the information to, to use it. And our code is available on GitHub. And if you have, if I have time for questions, I would love to take some. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Luna. So Jorge, please. Yeah, uh, th thanks for the talk. We have one question. We have time for just one question. Mm -hmm. Uh, by Salvador Arias, uh, who says, how ambiguity of uh, taxonomic names are dealt with in automatically in this kind, kind of approaches? How, how many, what was the first part of the question? How many uh, how, names? How, how ambiguous names, I mean, taxonomic ah. ambiguous names are, are dealt yeah, with? Yeah, so, 
So that is um, done in the curation step when you upload the phylogeny to the Open Tree of Life website. Um, if there, there is a tool, let me see if I can find it here. Um, that um, if you, uh, you upload your tree and then you, the Open Tree of Life asks you, if, asks you if you want to, um, to map, to standardize to the Open Tree of Life taxonomy. Mm, I will have to log in. <laughs> yes. And then it will give you options, basically. If um, this is very manual, if something is map, map, this, this. If everything, if something is ambiguous, um, failed, it will give you options. And then, yeah, it's basically that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. Th thanks uh, for the talk. I think we are a bit late, so perhaps we should move on to the next talk. Nati. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, we encourage you to keep further discussion the Discord platform. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanchez, again. So our next and also last speaker for the Symposium of Ventus in Phylogenetic Inference is Dr. Mark Simmons. So Dr. Maximus is gonna present his talk, Collapsing Dubiously Resolved Gene Tree Branches in Two-Step Coalescent Analysis of Phylogenomic Datasets. His 15-minute talk is gonna be followed by a five-minute Q&A session. Um, from now on, we won't be recording or streaming this talk because we do not have the permission to do so. So please refrain from sharing any materials from this particular talk. Dr. Mark Simmons is gonna be receiving questions in English and answering them in English as well. Dr. Simmons is a professor and herbarium curator at Colorado State University. Mark's research program consists of two interrelated components, conceptual aspects of molecular phylogenetics and systematics of the flowering plant family Celastrase. So welcome Dr. Mark Simmons. Okay, thank you, Natalia. And uh, I think my screen sharing is working. Yeah, it is it's working great. Okay, sounds good. So away we go. And